Hey everyone, welcome back to Honor for Hire, my turn-based RPG being developed in the Godot engine. I did it this time, I got a devlog out quickly. Now, since the last one dropped, I've been starting the work of transitioning into animation state machines, the result of a very helpful comment I got on the previous video, and one that definitely paid off in terms of shortening my code. I also focused my efforts on the systems I developed last time, fixing bugs that popped up and dealing with strange edge cases, as well as simplifying the way damage is dealt in a way that works for any new enemy that I add, no matter how weird the attack pattern may look. Now, before we get into this week of development, make sure to join the Discord, subscribe to the channel, and leave any questions or suggestions for the project below. And also let me know if you like this style of video where I just cover a little bit of progress rather than certain large systems. With that out of the way, let's get started. Alright, the first task in line came from this comment. The idea of transitioning to an animation state machine was to reduce the amount of code that any animation change took up. And it turns out that it also had the added benefit of cutting the amount of files stored in my project. But how did this work? Well, I needed to create a sprite sheet for the Spear Goblin so it could be my first test subject. As I discovered about 15 minutes into failed attempts, the animation player node does not work with animated sprites that I already had in place, and they require a sprite sheet to take those sprites from. So I went to a sprite, cracked my knuckles, and got ready and spent the next half hour hitting my head on my keyboard as I pressed copy and paste over and over and over. There were 128 frames for the Spear Goblin. Yeah, it took a little while. After it was finished, I could only hope that my time spent would not be in vain and the whole thing would actually work. And soon enough, I had all of the animations added into the animation player note. The way this works is by editing the frames property on the character's sprite, but before I did that, I had to make sure that the sprite sheet could be cut into even pieces, which cost me an extra 15 minutes when I realized some of the animations aren't the same number of tiles across as the other ones. Now in this animation player, there's a little bit that we need to look at. For one, I knew that I had 16 frames per second as my frame rate. The problem was, I divided it up and rounded off the numbers and did all of that work before I realized that the actual animation player has a way to just set the number of frames per second that your animation runs. So I wasted a little bit of time typing in manually 0.504 seconds for every single animation. But once you get to that point, all that you have to do is click on the sprite in question while keeping the animation open, navigate to the frame coordinates of the frame that you want to add, and then just press this key button right here, which allows you to add a keyframe for that frame and automatically advances to the next one. I just have to do eight of these for every single animation and then switch over to the next animation, and doing that allows me to rip through them pretty fast. Now the next step, once I got all of these done, was to add all of the animations into the animation tree, which meant I needed a way to check the direction before setting the animation. What, was this just going to be as much code as before? Did I need to use four different animation trees? Luckily, that was not the case, and I found a wonderful guide from Heartbeast on how to make directional animations using a blend space 2D, the link to which is in the description. So I got the four different animations set up in a blend space and went into the code to tackle the last challenge, putting it all together. You've all seen my code from the previous devlogs, so I think you'll easily be able to tell that I cut down on the total number of lines, as well as making things a bit cleaner to look at. I optimized the direction script by changing a line in the pathfinding, making it so that I have half the lines that I used to. And instead of using a direction facing variable, now all it does is set the blend position of each state within the tree. The attack function has been taken from 25 or so lines of code to, oh, about one. Same with the idle loop. The number of lines has been cut to a quarter of its original length. After a few minor bug fixes and working on ordering things correctly, it's now up and running, and the enemy is just as animated as before, the main difference being ease of changing animation, and of course, the simplicity of my code. Alright, here we go, next task. After completing the enemy in targeting and attacks, I wanted to go back and make sure that everything was working as intended, and perhaps add in some extra features before I got too far along in the project. So of course, I began by immediately overhauling the damage system as a whole. Don't worry though, there was a good reason. 
I got to thinking about future enemy attacks, and I was concerned that with some attacks with more random targeting methods, it'd be difficult to check if the player was still in danger after they'd moved. It would end up taking up a lot of space with random if statements just to check if the player should take damage, and overall would just be a lot of complication and many, many, many lines of GD script. So I decided to prevent this issue from occurring in the future by assigning each enemy their own targeted squares in an array, and then access this array, check if the player's position is equal to it, and do damage based on the attack's damage if they're still overlapping, all at turn start, of course. I added in a few lines here and an extra variable for this exact purpose. Different attacks pass a different damage value to the target squares function, which checks the damage and assigns the squares accordingly. Surprisingly, everything ran fine when I tried it for the first time, something I am still not used to with how far into the project I am. Next up was a feature mentioned in the last video briefly, but one that required a bit more work, the charge attack. I had the movement working, but there were several issues present within the attack. Obviously, it wasn't doing damage yet in the last video, but I fixed that issue with the new damage system. For one, when the goblin prepped the charge, it wouldn't face the right direction. It would also occasionally bug out at the end of a charge, waiting an extra turn to move, or sliding too fast with the wrong animation before fixing up the speed and direction it was traveling at. I figured I'd tackle the direction issue first since I'd just created a new system for determining a direction, and I found the issue lying in wait in the enemy's target position variable. See, the direction function checks the target position and whether or not it's equal to the last position the enemy occupied, then uses that comparison to determine which direction it faces. The problem is, I wasn't setting the enemy's target position until right when it needed to move for the charge attack, otherwise it would just move immediately when I set the position. This was a fairly easy fix. I just made it so the enemy couldn't move if it had a charge prep, and voila, issue solved. This works well in tandem with the stab, ensuring that no moves can be made if the enemy has any action prepped. The next problem was the odd movements at the end of a charge, but that was an easy enough fix once again. I got rid of a couple of unnecessary yield statements, meaning that the goblin could now move straight into its other actions. It didn't win a necessary extra turn after a charge before getting to its action. I also wanted to update the charge so the targeted squares would accurately represent where the character's in danger, as well as having the enemy move the full range that it should. I needed to check which side of the character the goblin was on before doing both of these things, which was a very simple pair of if-else statements comparing their x or y positions. After that, I could do two things. For one, I could target an additional square in that direction to show where the character will be in danger and deal damage if you remain in that tile. For another, I can make it so the enemy charges the full duration, even if the character moves out of the way to the side. That's done with this conditional that updates the target position depending on whether the two are lined up on the x-axis or not. The nice part about this charge attack functionality is that it should all continue to work if I introduce a dash or something else that makes the character move more than one tile. After all of that was completed, I took a look at my task list, a disorganized Google document, I figured it was time I took it into a more organized form in a planning software. Now, I've already got a Trello board that I showcased in a previous devlog, but it isn't a good choice for a long list of random tasks and ideas. I like to keep my Trello board compact and organized for the sake of clarity, but that meant I had to move the ideas list into something else. My brother had recently shown me the program Obsidian, so I checked it out and I absolutely love it. The nice part with Obsidian is the organization system, obviously, but more specifically, the way you can link things together. It all comes together on the graph here, and you can click on each individual branch to go into it and edit. Overall, I'm happy with the program, and I'll keep using it in the future as the scope and ideas in my game continue to be more fleshed out. Well, that's about it for today's progress update. I'm happy with how much I've gotten done since the last devlog dropped, and I'm definitely glad I'm more into the swing of things when it comes to working on the project. At the time of recording, I've already got every other character transitioned over to an animation state machine, and now it becomes time to start tackling the rest of the enemies in the meadow. Now that might take a couple of devlogs to get through, but I hope to have at least one new enemy for you guys by next month. I'm also working on a bit of art on the side as I'm working on things in programming so that I don't get too mixed up in just doing game engine work. I want to take out a few of the stranger bugs I ran into that I hadn't noticed before, which are a little interesting to say the least. I'm going to start posting progress updates on the Discord regularly, so do make sure you check out the link in the description, and 1000 subscribers is creeping ever closer, so let me know if you have any ideas for what I should do when I hit that milestone. I'm still considering the idea of a Q&A, but I'm open to any suggestions at this point. 
that'll be all for this one, though. Have a great day, everyone. Take care.